Okay, B6 panel, we're going to talk persistent memory. Got some great panelists for you here today. I'm Dave Eggleston, and we are actually live. So anything could happen. We could have dogs barking in the background, garbage yeah. trucks going by. We've got Tom in outer space somewhere. So stand your toes. We're not quite sure where this is going to go, but uh, hopefully you viewed some of the great presentations from uh, some of the panelists that we're going to have today. And let me introduce some of those panelists. I'm gonna start first with Josh Shi. She is the Vice President of Exadata Development at Oracle. Wave your hand there, Ja. I think she did already. Yeah, that's Ja. And she's gonna to talk to us about Oracle Exadata and their use of persistent memory. If you haven't had a chance to view her presentation yet, please do that. It's an exciting one. And then we also have Ginger, Ginger Gilsdorf. Ginger is a software engineer at Intel in the data center ecosystem engineering group. And she works with those enterprise software vendors to optimize their Intel hardware to bring persistent memory to life. So we're gonna have lots of great questions for, for Ginger as well. And then we've got Chris Peterson. And Chris is a hardware systems technologist at Facebook, and he's leading some of those roadmaps designing. He's been designing building servers, storage, and data center solutions for over 16 years. So compared to Tom and myself, he's just a baby in the industry. He's just getting started compared to old people. But he's very involved in CXL. So you're going to hear a lot from Chris about CXL. And then finally, we have the old hand, Tom Coughlin. Wave your hand there, Tom, from There's outer space. Hand. Looking yep. back at Earth, how is the space station there, Tom? Oh, very good, very good. Okay, plenty the of oxygen. You're gonna you're gonna make it through the session. I think so. Good, Tom. I, I've got too many paragraphs here for Tom, but Tom is the president of Coughlin Associates, and he's been doing digital storage analysis on on both the business and technology sides for, uh, he says, over 39 years. So. You know, that, that fine haircut he has there shows the, uh, the, the rings around the sun that he's done, the times around the sun. So thank you for joining us. So again, this session is sponsored by SNEA. So uh, SNEA will pay all our litigation bills if we get into trouble here. So I'm going to start first with, with Ja. Ja is our best storyteller. She did a great job of telling us a story about somebody named Ben who was trying to deposit a thousand dollars into his bank account and using persistent memory, he saved 200 microseconds. Ja, why oh, is say, <laughs> what, how many? 400, there were two IO oh, clips. Oh, there were two IO yeah. clips, thank you. I didn't pay close enough attention. So <laughs> no why, first question, why is saving 400 microseconds in, when you're doing OLTP, why is that important uh, and, and how does persistent memory help you solve that? Thank you. Thank you, Dave. Um, I'm really honored to be part of this panel and thank you for, you know, getting me to talk first. I'm excited about your, uh, your question and thank you for, in, you know, hopefully enjoy the story. So it was actually really a silly, simple story as a point of illustration, because I think most people uh, are familiar with the notion of, you know, a transaction when it comes to money and banking and all that, right? So it was really just kind of draw um, analogy between you know what a database needed to handle in that you know in our normal person's eyes you know a critical transaction the banking transaction but in the real world a lot of our customers are like the most they they have exadata run their most mission critical database workloads and these are um, not necessarily just the deposit thousand dollars into my banking account kind of transactions. They, there are, we have seen uh, cases where they're doing real time fraud tracking. For example, if you submit, click on a screen or submit any sort of, um, you know, transactions and whatnot before um, this financial institution will let you go through, they have to pull a, a ton of, you know, background checks and financial record checking just to be able to detect if this is a legit transaction or not. And for those critical business business use cases, um, those 400 microseconds or perhaps more are really uh, hurting the performances because you can imagine that, you know, you're basically waiting for the um, 
uh, spinning wheel to kind of you know finish it's working before you know the uh, control can go back to the actual application which is super critical so that's why um, I think I spent like maybe 30 seconds in the uh, in the talk to explain that this is just an illustration but we do have a lot of mission critical applications in the world that are today are falling off those IO clips that I had in the presentations where you know they are normally processing super fast on the CPU drawing everything from memory and CPU cache and all of a sudden they had to do an IO and then boom, the performance just, you know, runs to a grinding halt. And sure. that's why persistent memory yeah, is- so, so saving that additional time allows you to do other things in that time is kind of what I'm getting from you, is, is there's additional time to do yeah, the fraud really detection, et cetera. Reducing the low, uh, late latency and improving the throughput. You know, you turn a IO bound workload into a CPU cache, perhaps memory bound workload, closer to memory bound workload. And that is a profound impact on a lot of those super critical applications because they've never seen anything like that before. So it's still something where it's still uh, storage dependent, but you are relying on that persistence that is there in persistent memory. And, yeah. and as I recall, were you using it in app direct mode in order to get that capability? Yeah, correct. So we use the persistent memory in our storage tier. And as you have pointed out, this is critical because sure, you can pop in a PMEM on the compute side, right? But that has great limitations because your persistent memory is only local to that node. It cannot be accessed by other nodes. So in our story, in our architecture, we have a scale out storage architecture where we have a shared cache model. So what happens is you, there's a network between the client and the storage, but with that, it enables linear scaling, like linear your boundless scaling of your storage and now all the compute that needed to access this um, um, you know super hot data they can go direct to the persistent memory on the storage via RDMA and that is really what we call a, like kind of a trampoline right instead of falling off I a see. cliff you're trampoling over to you know to get the data into your compute and then you spend like in, in our case it's less than 1900 oh sorry less than 19 microseconds so it's very cool it's much closer to like a memory speed than like the the usual expected latency for doing IO to the storage. Okay, let's jump to Ginger now. Ginger gave us a fascinating talk. Ginger clearly has been watching a lot of Animal Planet during her time here uh, in COVID time uh, because uh, Ginger talked about butterflies, sharks, and wildebeest. So please view her, her <laughs> presentation to understand that. But she used that as a very interesting analogy that she drew between how these animals migrate and then how her customers migrate to using persistent memory. So uh, she said butterflies were those that use storage today. Sharks are those that have big, a whole lot of memory and wildebeests are the hybrid. So Ginger, first, uh, please identify yourself as butterfly, shark, or will, no, I, I better, <laughs> I, I, how about your customers? Where are your customers? Are they more butterflies, sharks, or wildebeests? And uh, what does that mean? Just give us some more context around migrating these customers to using persistent memory. Well, I honestly, I would want most of our customers to be in the wildebeest side of things because that's where you get the full benefit of persistent memory. That's where you're taking advantage of the persistence and not just using PMEM as a large, um, large capacity of memory. So that's where we find customers, like I said, get the full advantage of PMEM. And that's a really exciting kind of the game changing side of things, but it can also be the more difficult to implement. Um, but you go back to, hey, you do the, do the work to implement it the right way. And you see much like animals when they migrate, they do it for a reason and there's great benefit. Um, if you migrate your data into the PMEM app direct side of things, you're gonna get not just one benefit, usually usually multiple. So it really depends on the customer and yes. the application they're coming from. And then it sounds like how much work they're willing to put into exactly. that migration. Maybe give us a little more detail around that and some of the examples sure. that you've seen working with customers. Yeah, for the actual work that goes into modifying software, um, you know, the standard answer would be go look at the libraries in Persistent Memory Development Kit but I can add a little bit more color to that. Um, if you currently have a data set in DRAM, you know, you've grabbed some memory with a malloc of sorts and you've got a pointer to that memory. You're writing to it, reading from it, reading from it. You know, if, if you need it the whole time, your application's up, it stays there. Otherwise you can free that memory up. Well, 
if you want to use persistent memory in a similar fashion, then what you would do is um, memory map a file. Once your PMEM aware file system is set up, you memory map that file. And then from there, instead of a malloc, you're going to, like I said, memory map the file, and then you can work directly with reads and writes to that file. Um, and when you're done with it, you'll go through similar to a memory map unmap. And um, if, you, if you view it that way, it's, it doesn't seem like such a huge change. I think some companies get a little bit scared that it's going to be too much work, but if you can get it to a state where you're, you're um, almost swapping in the memory mapping instead of the mallocking, it becomes a lot less overwhelming. So one of the things I'm going to want to come back on and talk about later uh, and ask you about later is there was a question yesterday that came up or almost a statement which said, boy, persistent memory is great, but the ecosystem for making the transition is not really there. So I want to come back and, and talk about that a little bit later because I think that's important. And that's a question that seems to come up regularly is what is that ecosystem? What's Intel doing to help people right. migrate? So uh, a, a key one. So Chris. Chris, you said during your presentation, and thank you, Chris. You're, you're, I know you're going to talk about CXL. You're going to, you're just going to beat us with that CXL stick. But I think it is a, a good way for the industry to go, get consolidated. But you made a comment. You said DIMMs are not suitable for heterogeneous memory. Chris, what does that mean, and why do we care? Sure. Um, so I actually kind of think it comes back to your comment just now about ecosystem. So uh, I think some of the challenges that we've got is um, as we try and drive for further efficiency within the server designs, we have to make trade-offs typically. Um, and thus far, some of the trade-offs we've had to make are that if we put different types of media on a DIM, uh, that media controller is embedded within the CPU. And so we have to make some trade-offs there, right? We cannot support all types of media. Um, there is some mixing that has to happen. Um, you have to be able to deal with the um, different characteristics of that media on the same bus, as an example. And DIMMs were ultimately designed for a very specific purpose originally, many, many years ago now, right? I mean, they were specifically targeted at volatile memory and therefore they have very specific uh, power and thermal boundaries um, the, the pinouts are very precise, and th those are for all very good reasons, right? Um, but I think the challenge that we've got is as some of these additional media come out, um, there are perhaps better ways to consider packaging those um, into more efficient uh, solutions in general. So um, for, for example, let me interrupt here. So sure. I would imagine Facebook does not like throwing out all your DDR4 modules when you go to DDR5 based servers. Would you, would you indicate that that's, a, that's an issue for, for Facebook? So you wanna have that, that uh, abstraction to memory. Yeah, I would say in general, um, uh, having that abstraction is, is important for us, right? Because it allows us to, to more seamlessly move applications. In general, it's very difficult with the thousands of microservices that we have to support in our infrastructure to be able to do step function moves, right? It's got to be much more of a seamless, uh, as tra transparent of a migration as we're able to do. Um, and it also needs to align best with what is most efficient for different categories of applications. Right, so it's um, a move from DDR4 to DDR5, for example, is not necessarily uh, the right answer for all uh, applications, right? You, you may want to right size that. So enabling that, tr that uh, flexibility and the abstraction on top of that makes that much more seamless, plus you can right size it to the application. So how does CXL solve this, Chris? I mean, what, is, what does CXL do to address these kind of problems and, and give you this uh, ability to mix and match different types of memory uh, using this CXL uh, abstraction? Sure, so uh, CXL for the first time really allows us uh, to pull the memory controller or the media specific controllers out of the CPU itself. So now we have the ability to uh, have a CPU that has its uh, set of capabilities. Um, and then you can separate the memory controller for a particular media type. And you can optimize then for that specific media type. 
So you can optimize uh, in terms of bandwidth, in terms of latency, power, thermals, and so forth. And so it lets you uh, create the more uh, efficient solution there and ultimately create a more scalable solution. Um, so CXL lets us do this uh, because we now have an abstraction there, both at a, a, a physical and a protocol layer perspective. And now that we're introducing CXL 2.0, we're taking that a step further by providing a generic management interface as well, such that we can now create standard drivers uh, that will interact with any CXL memory device, regardless of the underlying media, right? And then uh, that ties into the whole transparency and seamless uh, approach that we're trying to build here. So I'll come back and ask you a bit later about CXL, the consortium, and then how people can get involved. And I see we had Yao join us. Hi, Yao. Good to see you. There she is. Good. So Yao, Yao Yu is joining us. She's an engineer and manager working at Twitter platform, and she had a great presentation. She's been working on distributed cash since 2010. And then she started, uh, started and managed the infrastructure performance and optimization team since 2017. And she's been talking, uh, I saw her at PM Summit earlier this year, did a great talk there and gave us quite a good update. So please view her presentation. So one of the questions I have for you, Yao, is you talked about persistent memory as denser storage gives you a TCO benefit. How much benefit are you getting at Twitter? Can you give us some idea how much benefit you get in going to persistent uh, memory instead of straight to storage? Well, if uh, something is really bonded by storage capacity, then you know, it really depends on what kind of pricing Intel is willing to, to part with. Ah, uh, so we put, <laughs> we put pressure back on Intel. Okay, go ahead though, yeah. Uh, but I, I think the, the, the tricky thing about uh, an actual service is there are um, many things come into play, right? So it, it sort of boils down to where the bottleneck is. I think what we have seen is, uh, uh, to, to truly answer this question, uh, basically you need to ask, where's the current bottleneck? Does using PMEM shift the bottleneck? And, and, the, and, and, the, and the game will be uh, depending uh, on that. And, and uh, for, for ca uh, using cash, for example, right? Previously, uh, you know, we are largely bottlenecked on memory capacity. So we're expecting some decent savings by going to persistent memory. But uh, on the other hand, we need to be careful that we're not introducing persistent memory bandwidth or latency as a, a new bottleneck for throughput. Right. right. Yeah, so, you made it. So, you made in your presentation. You you made that really clear that you didn't want you have kind of a networking bottleneck right now, and you didn't want to go pass that. You didn't want to push that bottleneck into persistent memory. And then towards the end of your presentation, you talked about this new architecture. And, and you made a comment in heading into that. You said that persistent memory behaves more like an SSD than DRAM. What, what do you mean by that? And how does that impact your architectural choices going forward? It really favors, uh, strongly favors sequential read and write is, is what I'm uh, alluding to when I said that. Um, uh, of course, we want to take advantage of the smaller granularity, uh, but uh, I think, it, especially if someone comes from a, a, a perspective of using DRAM, I think that is an, a, a nice sort of a summary to have, like how can you think more like you're programming a storage device versus, a, versus DRAM? Of course, if you come from the other side, then you already know that there's nothing really add, to add there. So, so I, I just want to call out, like for people who are uh, similar, have similar experience as I had, which is, you know, heavily, reliant on, on memory, then I, I think that is a paradigm shift. And I think another thing that came out in your presentation was, you know, you worked very closely with Intel and you talked about how when Intel ran it in their lab, they got a certain result, but then when you ran it to your lab, well, you didn't get quite the same result. And, and kind of the message I got out of that was make sure you do your own homework, do your own work. So talk about that a little bit more, how you worked with Intel in kind of a collaborative way to get uh, persistent memory up and running. Yeah, so I, we started with Intel and started early because I, I knew sort of right, get, get to the right how, uh, software design is not going to be straightforward, right? I, I, I was expecting some wrinkles as, as with um, most new hardware. So uh, working with Intel really gave, a, uh, gave us a head start because they had the equipment ready to, to be tested. Uh, on the other hand, their lab will have a particular configuration that may or may not be the same as what uh, you know eventually consumers will have. S specifically, they can populate all the DIMMs, 
And most certainly Twitter does not want to populate all the DMs with PMAN that we can afford. That's just too expensive. Right. All right, so, so, so this type of thing, uh, uh, I, I think it's really important to, to sort of understand the, the, the configuration and uh, the, the, the key vectors in the configuration and make sure we test those thoroughly. Got it. Okay, and then Tom, uh, during your talk, you showed a very interesting chart. I want to pull up uh, something here, and it was really about the the market forecast for persistent memory. And you showed uh, 3D Crosspoint in particular on a petabyte basis, it, it, getting very close to maybe even getting equal to DRAM shipments by the end of this decade, and and that's pretty great growth because. What do you think this means for the memory makers? Because right now today, it's really only Micron manufacturing this uh, for Intel, but what do you see occurring in that as that market grows and what will happen in the supply of the persistent memory technology itself? Sure, well, first of all, I should point out that that vertical scale is a log scale. So, uh, so there is some difference between them, but, uh, but yes, there's a, uh, uh, the 3D cross point in particular, we show uh, uh, increasing demand um, in fact, uh, uh, Intel apparently is now ma finally making money on their 3D crosspoint, um, which was actually, uh, and so they must be making enough volume now that they're, uh, uh, that they're able to amortize their equipment. Well, I would, I will interrupt and say, check with Mark Webb. He, he says a little bit different. He says they're still losing money. Uh, Ginger's nodding her head. I, I won't take that as confirmation about Intel either way, but uh, no, go ahead, Tom. Oh, well, let's say they're, they're not losing as much money then. Uh, and uh, the other thing is that uh, Micron uh, has finally, last year, uh, introduced uh, their own 3D Crosspoint product, and they say they have some customers that are uh, that are using it, although they can't say in public. At least when I spoke to them last week, that's what they said. So um, I think that uh, using some 3D Crosspoint, its biggest use is in uh, replacing DRAM, uh, and so the DIMMs or whatever that would be when you're in the CXL type of environment. I think there's, a, there's some real possibilities there. Um, and uh, I think that that's, uh, there are, but there also are a number of manufacturers now that are designing storage systems uh, that are using a, a 3D cross point uh, in the in, in, uh, um, SSDs um, as well. So uh, it looks like there's, uh, there's some take up on it. Uh, there's use for that as a way. I've seen a few vendors now that are, that are using Optane as a a write cache um, and using higher um, higher density flash like QLC flash in order to reduce the wear on the QLC flash and to make a low cost uh, but uh, high endurance storage system as a result of that, at least that's the claims. Um, and actually there's a question you put in there, Dave, that I just, I just looked there and you're asking about uh, uh, cloud providers provide systems with 3D cross. Yeah, why don't, you, why don't you grab that question? I think that's a great one and uh, I'll read it out loud in case people I will are read seeing it. Yeah, it. yeah thanks, go ahead. Because I've got, an easy, I've got, an because easy. We got Yeah, we got Facebook, Oracle and Twitter here, which all have cloud services. They can answer those questions for us. Go ahead, Tom. Indeed, but your question was, you're wondering if the endurance of 3D cross point makes it unsuitable for the cloud since an evildoer can intentionally wear out the 3D cross point dims. Now, if someone's using this as infrastructure, they probably have control, direct control of that. So I think the basic issue of that would be uh, for a public cloud, but with a public cloud, you're gonna be paying for what you're using. So it's probably fine if they wear them out, they're gonna pay for it. That's the yeah, and by the way, that, that, that question isn't from me to myself. That's uh, Marty in the background typing the audience questions to us. But right. yeah, I'd like to hear it. Job, please go ahead, Oracle yeah. and then Twitter and Facebook. Yeah. So I want to just say, actually, 3D Crosspoint is already available in the Oracle public cloud today. In fact, we actually launched it, I think, back in September. So it's out for a couple months now. And uh, it's really, like, just to answer that point, what happened is the, the 3D Crosspoint, the persistent memory that we have, as I told the story in my presentation, it was used as a cache and a log um, commit accelerator on the storage side. So just kind of echoing what Tom just said, it's very much sort of a controlled workloads, right? It's driven by the database workloads. It's governed by how many, you know, random reads that the application is going to issue and how many log writes application is going to issue. I see. So, so very specifically so, for Oracle, it has to do with the workload. And if it's the right workload, then you'll steer it to persistent memory. Right, right. So and there's then, really yeah, no wearing it out. 
And then, yeah, no. what about for Twitter? I, I remember you saying earlier this year that uh, Twitter had that in production. Yeah, so we had it in production as Canary. We haven't got to volume. Uh, one of the uh, hurdles we, uh, we are waiting to clear is we actually do want to accumulate uh, more workloads that benefit from persistent memory to get the inventory more manageable. So, so I think for anybody who is not renting persistent memory, that might become a thing, right? Like if you only need it for a hundred hosts, it doesn't really make too much sense. If you need it for thousands of hosts, that, that, that is much more reasonable. So ah. I, I think there's gonna be a delayed sort of gatekeeping effect on just on inventory management. I get it. So if enough workloads need it, then it makes sense to deploy it. How about for Facebook, Chris? Where, where are you at on your examination of, of persistent memory and deployment? I haven't heard of Facebook deploying it yet, but uh, maybe you can break some news for us. Yeah, so we've we've been exploring uh, for you Crosspoint uh, as well as any um, of the al alternate uh, media type for quite some time now. Um, I, I think uh, actually Yao uh, stated it very well. So in general, for us to productize anything, there needs to be a sufficiently large enough uh, TCO benefit. Um, and that therefore implies that there has to be enough uh, application volume to justify the effort. Um, at this point, that does not yet exist. Um, so uh, uh, our, our needs are uh, not currently uh, well enough aligned with uh, what we're seeing out of 3D Crosspoint. And so we will continue to explore it and we're working closely with Intel and others uh, on making some improvements there, but it does not currently align well with our application requirements. Got it. And then Chris, we only got to have a couple minutes left. So please, Transition us into a CXL. We, we tabled that for a little bit, but you know what, what's going on with CXL Consortium? Um, talk to us a little bit about the work group you lead and, and why this, this, uh, the viewers of this panel should care. <laughs> sure. Uh, so CXL or Computer Express Link has been around. Uh, so we've been incorporated for about a year now. Um, so we launched the uh, 1.1 spec uh, last year. And we just announced uh, in the past week the 2.0 spec. Um, so uh, within a one-year cadence, we've been able to release a, a, a one, one, uh, an additional uh, spec generation. Um, and uh, the, the organization in general is very, very healthy and has uh, quite a lot of contributing companies in it um, and continues to grow very, uh, very rapidly. Um, among other things, one of the areas that we're very focused on is, of course, memory, and I'm using that in the most broad possible way. Um, uh, so one of the work groups that we have uh, as, a, as a part of the consortium is a memory systems work group. Um, that is a work group that I chair. Um, our focus and our charter is primarily to look at um, what are the potential use cases, the potential applications of memory devices on CXL and how can we improve the interface uh, to ensure that we have those use cases covered. Um, as an example, one of the pieces that I alluded to in my presentation that we've recently released is this management interface, right? So this adds this abstraction layer for uh, CXL memory devices that allows us to use the same driver, for example, and we can do things like um, uh, collect uh, error information, uh, update firmware, monitor temperatures, all with a standardized interface, right? So regardless of the specific media, whether it's 3D Crosspoint or, any, or something else, uh, you know, we have that commonality. And from a, uh, an end customer perspective, that is very important for us. That really makes the integration and migrations much more seamless. And then what are the key things for any new interfaces? When is there going to be native hardware support for it? So when do you expect CPUs that have native support for CXL to appear? And will that be, what version of CXL do you expect that to be? Or is that still up in the air? Yeah, so I, I won't be able to comment on specific products, of course. You'll have to go talk to our favorite uh, CPU providers for that. Um, but what I can tell you is that all of the major CPU providers are on the board of CXL. Um, there are a number of product uh, development efforts in flight, and uh, I would expect to start seeing some interesting things happening next year. 
Yeah, it's one of the things I've noticed is in your work group, there, there is a lot of interaction between those CPU providers and then the, the memory makers and those who are, who are exploring even uh, making the interface chips, the SOCs that are going to go in between memory and the CPU. So that's great right. to see in the ecosystem. So we're almost out of time. And I'm going to throw it back to Ginger because I think we tabled one question, which was, what is Intel doing to create this ecosystem to help customers move towards persistent memory? And, and uh, like I mentioned, this is a, a question that came up even yesterday. So Ginger, please go ahead and close us out with that. Uh, with by, this by the way, answering. Uh, Marty this. says you can go to 1125 if you want. Oh, outstanding. Then, Ginger, yeah. we can stretch that out and you can get more time. <laughs> and there are quite a few questions coming in to, to answer here. Go ahead. Yeah, yeah. So I'll address the, the question of what is Intel doing to enable the ecosystem. Um, well, we have already built quite a strong portfolio of ISV vendors, um, hardware or OEMs, and uh, even virtualization technologies that already take advantage of persistent memory, whether in AppDirect or memory mode. But there's still there's still plenty of work to do for sure. Um, in some ways, especially with respect to the public cloud adoption, I know that's been a question. Mm -hmm. It's it's really a chicken and egg kind of debate. Public cloud providers want us to show applications that are running well on persistent memory. Applications or vendors want us to want to see persistent memory in the cloud before they adopt it. Um, so we are kind of struggling with that right now and public cloud, of course, um, right now the access is really kind of application specific. Uh, you can access SAP HANA instances in Azure, for instance, but we do, we do expect that as time goes on and we have more of these really good examples of applications that run well on persistent memory, the overall persistent memory adoption, as well as in the public cloud, will, will continue to increase. It's just a little bit of a ramp up. Great. Since we have a little bit more time, Marty has graciously given us more time. Ja, what's next for Oracle in using persistent memory in Exadata? You gave us some good examples of how it's used for the for OLTP uh, in the caching and then also in the logging, but what's next? Yeah, so as you know, Dave, like the, the database market is very big. There are many different kind of applications. And what we have zoomed in on is a very sort of a very specific market, right? The OLTP market that we've talked about. And then many of us, you know, who are in the database world will be like, oh, you know, what's going to happen with the analytics, like the, the data warehousing workloads, right? What are you guys doing with the um, persistent memory there? What are the opportunities there as well? Um, and also just echoing on, like, you know, just using persistent memory as larger um, memory, right? Like, you know, in the memory mode, because so far we have been using it in the app direct mode inside the storage to build like a hierarchical tiered caching, right? You know, persistent memory being on the very, you know, cream of the crop at the very top, then you layer it with, you know, flash in the middle and hard disk at the bottom. So what, you know, that's a very specific use case for storage that, you know, we felt like it's really strong. It's, you know, a huge differentiator, big disruptive changes to our Exadata story. But, you know, looking forward, we feel like there's many different, you know, places that we still haven't yet explored, right? So I think, you know, these are the areas that, you know, we're actively looking at. And also I would wanted to say that just, if you look at the data design from the get-go, that was like, I don't know, decades ago, right? And then you look at um, the database design about, you know, building an index. It's very, the data structures are very storage friendly, right? It talks about how I can, you know, persist that. You never write it in memory hash table, and persistent into storage because that's just too hard. But now you have persistent memory, that really begs the question, right? Do you really have to write a B tree index? So those are the bigger questions that yet to be answered. I think a lot of people like us are, you know, kind of working on that. So, uh, Ja, I think this one, maybe you're the right person to, to steer this to. There is a question here that said, can you have Optane DIMMs, 3D Crosspoint DIMMs, and DRAM DIMMs on the same memory channel, or would you have to put it on two different memory channels? Good, good question. Do you happen to know? Actually, Intel, yeah, Intel population rule says, so shall put a DRAM DIMM and a persistent memory DIMM on the same memory channel. That's so how you, you better, populate So you better it. put them both on the same channel. Remote. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. Yes. <laughs> okay, good. So I think we've Thank answered. You for talking. Yes. Yeah, we've answered that question. And then there's one here also about public cloud providers 
And when you're using 3D Crosspoint in memory mode, I guess this would go to Ginger, and it says, how is a club, public cloud provider supposed to know how many writes occurred and charge the user per write? Boy, that seems like a, a very interesting question. That meter is running, and uh, is that yeah. e each turn of the crank? Yeah, that's something I don't, I, I don't have a great answer for that, unfortunately. Um, but the way that memory mode works is the system sees your persistent memory as the memory in the system and it doesn't recognize DRAM separately. DRAM is just a cache for the persistent memory capacity. Um, so any, any reads and writes to that, um, I mean, are, are treated as if they're writing to memory. And I'm assuming that most public clouds don't have a way to meterize that kind of writes yet. So I think that would be probably a challenge more of a challenge if they wanted to add some meters to um, persistent memory writes. Got Sorry, it. I don't have a great answer for that. <laughs> no worries. You know, that's what we're here for is to see what we can answer or maybe not answer. I'm going to knock a couple of these out myself because I, I think I may know an answer. But uh, and then I'm going to steer one to Chris. So stay on point here, Chris. That, but first, I'm going to say there's one that says, how much power do you expect a CXL interface chip that drives DRAM DIMMs to consume? Well, what I'll do is uh, I'll say I'll compare between DRAM DIMMs and CXL. With CXL, it is going to consume more power. We can see that even in this, the module itself. Keep in mind that DRAM DIMMs are going to be somewhere about 15 to 18 watts. That's been one of the challenges for Intel on Optane is how to fit those DIMMs into that 15 to 18 watt envelope because persistent memory does like to consume a bit more power. Once you add in the PCIe, and I see Chris nodding here, once you add in the PCIe interface, which is what the, the PHY is for CXL, that's going to consume more power. So we can expect, um, and I've been using E1.S as a module example for persistent memory, we can expect that that's going to consume more than a DRAM DIMM, maybe up to around 25 watts seems to be what uh, most most of the uh, manufacturers are planning for. So I think that's something to look ahead for. One other thing is said, uh, when do you expect NVDIMP to be at products to be announced and what kind of competition would that, uh, would that pose? Uh, I'll take that out. Being independent, I'll take that one myself. I don't see the native support for NVDIMP coming on CPUs. So uh, whereas NVDIMP was appeared to have some more momentum a year or two ago. I think it's kind of lost that momentum uh, to CXL and looking at CXL modules. So uh, I'm, I'm still holding my breath uh, if we see NVDIMP modules. I think there was also, Chris made this point earlier that mixing different types of memory on the same memory bus uh, has some problems. So even managing that in the memory controller in the CPU, that, that gives it a problem. So Chris, let's throw this one to you. It says, do you see, how do you see the latency of persistent memory behind CXL affecting the software applications? And that gets us into why CXL, Gen Z, C6, or Open Cappy. And those are, there are some latency differences there, but again, kind of, you're the CXL pitch man. Tell us why CXL. Yeah, so uh, first of all, let's, whenever we talk about latency, um, I think Yao actually alluded to this quite nicely. Um, we have to look at things at the application level because that's typically the level that actually matters, right? So we have to think about day, we have to think about Ben and his thousand dollars going in. That's Thank exactly you, John. right. We have to worry about the end user here, and and we need to keep Ben happy, right? So that's that's the goal in life, right? Um, so it, we have to look at things at that level. So uh, whether or not the additive latency um, will make a difference is of course, therefore application dependent, right? In many cases, uh, there's a, an entire stack of latency that builds up, right? Whether that's uh, because of the software layers that you have to go through the network hops, um, through the CPUs caching infrastructure, through the memory controller and so forth, right? There's, it, it, it depends uh, ultimately. Now, more specifically, I would also argue it will depend on the specific media that you're comparing against. So the additive latency may make more of a difference when you're comparing uh, to something that's already low latency, like DRAM, for example. Um, but on the other hand, if you're comparing it to another media like, say, 3D Crosspoint, it may only be a very small percentage relative to the 3D Crosspoint latency. And as a result, it may not be material uh, indifference, right? So ultimately, the, the correct answer to look at is always application level, but it, it will also be media dependent. 
Yeah, so for us hardware guys that focus so much on latency, we've got to consider that software stack and, and how that impacts things. That's and right. then as several of the speakers have, have made clear, we have to think about the workloads there as well. Okay, I think we're it's going to be time to wrap up. Uh, and if you like this session, um, you know, there's going to be more of it next year. And the, the, the Persistent Memory Summit is going to widen out from SNEA, is going to widen out and also include computational storage next year. Look for that on April 20 and 21, I believe, are the scheduled dates. It's a two-day virtual event, and I would expect to see many of these same speakers. Um, we're also going to try and answer all the questions that came in that may take a day or two before we get to all those questions. But thank you very much. Uh, thanks for joining. And thanks so much for my panelists for being good sports and, and uh, bringing this to life. Like I said at the top, anything could happen. And I think we've pulled off a pretty good session. So really, really appreciate your, your uh, chipping in and joining me here. Thanks so much. Take care, guys. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you, Dave. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. Bye.